So, hello friends. I'll be talking on this uh, topic tele ICU and uh, tele rounds. Um, so, this talk I gave in uh, national conference in Indoor on 26th uh, February 2023. So, this was a 20 minute talk that I had to give. So the topics that I covered in this, uh, it is more with reference to the application of tele-ICU in India. A bit of about the background of tele-ICU and uh, is there a good hard evidence for adopting tele-ICU in the current scenario is what we look at. And what are the key components of the processes involved in tele-ICU? And what are the factors that influence the success of tele-ICU is what we will touch about. And we will talk about the unique uh, sort of an advantage tele-ICU had during COVID and our experience in Karnataka. And then we will talk about what are the problems in healthcare system that is plaguing India at this point of time. And whether tele-ICU or digital health can be a solution. And what are the solutions that we have already garnered and adopted currently in India is what we'll talk about. So when you look at this cartoon, it pretty much depicts what tele-ICU is all about. As you see, there is a doctor trying to navigate someone who is lost in the uncharted sea or uncharted problem with the help of audio-visual aids, which may be linked to the satellite and so on and so forth. So this, this pretty much summarizes the tele-ICU. So someone who is navigating from a remote place is called offsite. So this words I'll be using it uh, interchangeably. So the offsite person is one who is sitting in a command center and offering tele-ICU services. The one who is actively on ground, taking care of the patient and taking vantage inputs from the command center, we call it as on-site personnel or on-site doctors. So when you look at the adoption of tele-ICU, if you see this graph, the data has been exponentially increasing from 2002. There has been a significant uptake of tele-ICU services in US. So, and these are the statistics. The so, tele-ICU adoption in 2003 was 0.4%, which has increased to 4.6% in 2010. So, post-COVID, you, I would have, one would uh, assume that this figure has significantly improved. And the Tele bets have increased from 0.9% to 7.9%. And in 2009, 4,900 US bets were connected to Tele ICU. And currently, more than a million are being monitored. I'm sure the number would be very staggering at this point of time post COVID. So, this is the sort of a uh, reference statistics we have. So, what do we do in Tele ICU is pretty much the same as what we do in ICU. We do clinical examination, we capture the clinical variables and then we capture the monitored variables and then we capture the investigative modalities which could be all the blood tests or the imaging and then we integrate all the information derived from the clinical, monitored and investigative modalities to establish diagnosis and charter the plan of treatment. So same thing what we do on the bedside is pretty much done in tele-ICU where we are capturing clinical variables, monitored variables, and investigative variables on electronic platform. So the methods to assess programs. So, so one needs to ask oneself, what is the thing that we should look at to see the success of tele-ICU? So all the studies that I would show have looked at what has been the SMR, standardized mortality rate, prior to adoption of tele-ICU, and what has been the length of stay. And is there a change in the standardized mortality rate or length of stay post adoption of tele ICU is what the studies have looked at. So this is one study, which is a fairly recent study came in 2019 from US, where they showed adoption of tele ICU reduced the overall SMR by 0.75, the odds ratio was 0.75, which attained statistically significant. And in patients where, or in organization where the SMR, baseline SMR was much higher, the effect of tele-ICU was a lot more pronounced and significant. So as you see, the odds ratio was significantly less. So which means to say in ICUs where SMR is higher, where adoption of quality indicators is not happening or best practice guidelines is not happening, these are the areas which are going to maximally benefit from adoption of tele-ICU. 
as opposed to places where smr is already low where icus are performing very well where there is uh, incorporation of quality indicators as you see any place where there is baseline smr is low which means they are already performing well the role of tele icu may not be very effective as you see the odds ratio is not statistically significant so this basically sends a message tele icu is significantly advantageous in places where uh, incorporation of quality indicators may not be very effective and where the mortality especially the standardized mortality rates are much higher so these are uh, just collected around six studies and all these studies show that adoption of tele icu shows reduction in see as you see this rosenfield at all 45% reduction in mortality 30% reduction in length of stay and most importantly which may be beneficial for india is 16% reduction in the cost that they demonstrated by adoption of tele icu so this is another study by us 5% reduction in mortality and median reduction of 1.8 days in the length of stay and 25% reduction in the cost so this was another study again showing reduction in length of stay and reduction in smr and this is another study which showed reduction in length of stay this is another study again showing length of stay and reduction so as you see all the studies that are being shown have one equivocal sort of a uh, depiction that there is reduction in the cost factor which may be very advantageous in a country like india so this study showed there was reduction in the cardiac arrest because of the tele icu monitoring so this was another study of, uh, which was from the group of uh, aast group from canada where they showed before tele icu incorporation the mortality of 5.5% after tele icu the mortality significantly reduced to 2.6% so this was another study from us again showing reduction in icu mortality from 8.4 to 3.1 as you see all these are statistically significant where by adoption of tele icu they could show some mortality benefit and obviously these are little older studies so this was just the tele icu setup we had during covid when we were offering tele icu services to the district hospitals so what is most important for this ingredient for the success of tele icu is the benefit of tele icu that we are offering to an on site center is directly proportional to their acceptance of technology to their acceptance of the concept of tele icu and their acceptance to change the processes and to change the uh, the sops that needs to be incorporated and their their intent and resolve to adopt best practice guidelines their intent and uh, resolve to adopt quality indicators that should be there to influence change in tele icu that is extraordinarily important and off site support team which is the command center where tele icu is sitting there will be always a team with doctors and nurses and their whole responsibility would be to keep a tab on all the monitored variables and try to detect early any sort of a events that may be setting in which may lead to a sentinel event and respond so audio visual aids are used to communicate with the on site center and take step to prevent the adverse events and most importantly adherence to the best practice guidelines and constant knowledge transfers with regards to standardized protocol incorporation keeps happening from the command side to the on site doctors and all this has shown to significantly reduce the cost of treatment and reduce the length of stay that significantly lessens the healthcare burden with regards to cost and off site team Uh, so the clinical staff the success of the tele icu is very much dependent on the seniority of the personnel who are delivering tele icu so it is very important the person in the command center should be an experienced person who has good knowledge and who has a rich experience and most importantly he must be actively be involved in day to day icu care in a busy icu center because nowadays you see people offering tele icu who do not necessarily have wherewithal of working on ground dealing with the families communicating with the families and understand the clinical nuances of managing a patient on site will she is mandatorily be to be present so this is a very important message i'm sending across because tele icu should be offered by a busy unit where clinicians are working on ground and maybe if you have a month three weeks they are working in a busy icu and one week they are rostered in the tele icu because that is where the effective delivery of tele icu happens 
because very often you would see nowadays people who are not working in busy ICUs, they are sitting in a four-walled room and offering tele-ICU and definitely they cannot cater to the expected level that one would expect because one needs to understand the day-to-day -day nuances and the families uh, and the communication with the family and the socio-economic dynamics and the latest advances that are happening at the ground level is very, very important. And the person offering tele-ICU need to be aware of the local medical legal issues that govern the care of uh, patients in ICU. And he should be knowledgeable, aware of the latest evidence that needs to be incorporated with regards to intervention, establishing diagnosis and management principles. And whilst the off-site center is offering these services, they should be able to recognize the champions on the on-site and recognize them. And most of the decisions that are made should be a shared decision, empowering people who are on the ground with regards to training and imparting of skills for the personnel who are on site. So this is this is the whole concept of tele-ICU. So the key essence is the personnel offering tele-ICU should be of a seniority, of a good seniority, good knowledge, and aware of good evidence and adoption of good best practice guidelines and all the protocols. And he should be in a position to collaborate effectively to do good knowledge transfer, impart the skills to the on-site doctor and involve them in the decisions that he is making is extraordinarily important. So that is about the clinical aspect. Then in tele it is equally important that the non-clinical staff also have important role. When I say non-clinical, it is the technical expertise or the IT personnel. Their involvement also becomes important so that the technological conduits that are there to offer tele should be seamless and they should not have impediments or interruptions because this leads to uh, ineffective delivery of tele -ICU. Just a pictorial representation, uh, CARI is our hospital and uh, we were offering to the district hospital where uh, we use audio-visual aids uh, and uh, so on and so forth to connect to the on-site center. And if there is interruption in this technological interface or if there is glitches, then the tolerance of the off-site center offering tele -ICU would uh, dwindle and the effectiveness of the care that is provided becomes questionable. So it is important that uh, there is a very proficient, effective team or IT team or uh, electronic medical records team who are constantly working to keep this digital interface seamless when tele -ICU is being offered. So as I said, the integration and acceptance of tele -ICU is greater when performance indicators are in place. And like in ICU, which is a teamwork, tele ICU also is a teamwork where effective transformational collaboration should happen with an on site center, which means there should be an excellent rapport that should be established with the doctors on site by the off site by constant sharing of best practice guidelines, protocols, and knowledge transfer. And this needs to be happening in a continuous way. And this, there is something called social learning theory in tele-ICU. What this means is involving the on-site doctors in the decision-making for the patient and involving them and empowering them about any decisions made for their patients leads to success of tele-ICU. And, and any decisions that are made should be a shared decision-making involving the doctors. And that is what we mean by social learning theory. And that needs to be sensitized and the sensibilities of this should be owned by the on-site team and off-site team. This is, this is the quintessence of seeing the success of tele-ICU. And as you see, the most important aspect that gets incorporated in tele-ICU are the best practice guidelines adherence and admission reviews and audits that should happen, whether uh, incorporation of tele-ICU is leading to change in the outcomes. And as you see, most importantly, studies have shown the key component that gets adopted is the educational and the knowledge transfer and the training that happens. I think these are the key aspects. So at the end of this lecture, if you remember what tele-ICU offers, tele-ICU offers adoption of the best practice guidelines, adoption of quality indicators, and adoption of review to see whether it is creating any change with regards to the endpoints. And most important is educational component and imparting of the skills that needs to happen and the knowledge as well. I think these are the salient aspects 
which should form the core essence of tele ICU that you are offering. And as I said, again, showing graphically 14% maximum is the adoption of best practice guidelines and admission reviews and your education and training is what is the key components that one need to focus on. Um, so I think that's what is reflected in these graphs. So now we'll move slowly to what happened to tele ICU during COVID. So in COVID, uh, this was a paper which came in the thick of COVID, how tele ICU was immensely beneficial in offering care to the COVID patients. So what happened in COVID was incorporation of uh, COVID protocols happened in a seamless way by the adoption of tele ICU. And uh, tele ICU was also utilized to train on site doctors in Karnataka, where we adopted tele ICU in all the districts. And we were the command center offering tele ICU to 15 districts. We trained the on site doctors about the way to tweak the ventilatory modes, and training on ventilation happened online and on tele ICU uh, interfaces. And this made a significant difference to the outcome of the patients. And tele-ICU delivery personnel should also be able to innovate and be flexible with some innovative ideas when they're offering tele-ICU, uh, suiting the local needs of the on-site center. So this is also becomes important. So tweaking the modes of ventilation was possible and evaluating the response of the patient to ventilation also was possible with tele-ICU using audiovisual aids. And change in the operational pathways also was possible in with tele ICU. So, what did we do in Karnataka? So, our center, the Manipal Hospital Ashwantpur, we gave tele ICU services to 15 districts in Karnataka, 24 months, two years in a relentless way, four hours in the morning, four hours. So, we, we don't call this tele ICU, we did more as tele rounds. And this showed significant reduction in the death, which I'll show the graphs. And there was a constant knowledge transfer that was happening to these district hospital doctors about all the protocols that we were incorporating in, in our uh, hospitals. And there was a imparting of skills with the training them on mechanical ventilation, hemodynamic monitoring. And there was a constant exchange of protocols that we were developing, uh, we, which we were sharing with the on-site doctors. And this translated into the change in the outcomes. And I will show you with these graphs. So this was the case fatality rate of Bangalore in the thick of COVID in the second wave. When you compare with all the other metros, if you see Bangalore was the lowest CFR when compared to Chennai, Delhi, Mumbai, and Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad was the highest. So I am not saying that tele ICU made the difference, but we were doing something different, which kept our case fatality rate very low. And if you say Bangalore is advanced, so possibly CFR, we compared only the district because we were offering tele ICU to all the districts also. And as you see, the Maharashtra district CFR was the highest, followed by Gujarat CFR and Tamil Nadu CFR also was going up and our Karnataka CFR was coming down. This is only the district data. So which means to say something we were doing, which was making change with regards to outcome. What we did was essentially the huge capacity building. Because when we started tele ICU to the districts, half of the districts did not have oxygen plant, which we realized upfront when we, because there was a lot of exchange of information that was happening. And there was a constant education happening. And there was constant learning of the on site team that was happening. There was dissemination of knowledge happening. There was checklists that were created. There was collaborative sort of an effort that was happening between district hospital and us. And all in all, it was a win win situation that we were influencing the outcomes in these district hospitals. And today, Karnataka is proud that every district has an oxygen plan and every ICU is equipped with the ventilators for the number of beds they have and HF and all this could happen uh, with constant collaboration that was happening on a tele-ICU. And to that effect, we published this review article on our experience on telemedicine and tele-rounds. As you see, Dr. Trilok Chandra was a co-author. He was the health commissioner at that point of time. And we published this about our experience in Karnataka. So we wish to deeply acknowledge Karnataka government, which partnered with us and had confidence in us that we could transform lives during COVID. So we thank uh, government of Karnataka and our commissioner and our district hospital doctors and our hospital, which partnered to influence and save lives in districts. So this was our Karnataka story. So now, what are the problems that India is facing at this point of time? In India, there are two to three ICU beds for one lakh population. 
And if you compare this with Europe, in Germany, there are 29.2 beds for 1 lakh. And even Kathmandu has, I mean, the Nepal has higher beds, 2.8 per 1 lakh population. So India has abysmal number of ICU beds proportionate to the population. And we have roughly around 12,000 maybe trained intensivists. And there are 1.7 nurses per 1,000 uh, ratio, which is again less. The WHO mandate is there should be three nurses to 1,000 population. So again, there we falter. And in India, there is a huge public-private disparity. And these are some of the stats uh, of the number of ICU beds in private. As you see, private has more ICU beds, 59,000, and public is 30. This is pre-COVID data. And number of ventilators in private uh, obviously is more and it is much lesser in public. But this ratio may have changed post-COVID because there was a huge capacity building that happened with regards to procurement of ventilators in the public hospitals, in government hospitals, and ICU beds possibly also have increased. And the present of digital infrastructure also is a problem in India, high-speed internet connectivity, which is all happening and maintenance of electronic medical records at the Taluka hospitals and uh, having tele-ICU sort of a facilities in Taluka and district hospital. These are all inadequate, but these are all improving. I'll show you what is happening in India. So this has, these were all the problems that India was facing, high-speed internet connectivity, electronic medical records, and the, and the tele-ICU equipment. So what is the solution for this? So solution, the only solution is which we proposed at that point of time because we presented our Karnataka model to the union uh, health secretary who visited and saw our model. So the only way we could do it is create a digital command center which could uh, serve the Taluka hospitals uh, and then they have a sort of a command center which could oversee the uh, tele-ICU services. So for this, we needed to set up a tele-ICU uh, sort of a domain uh, within this uh, healthcare framework and have a constant training program to incorporate best practice guidelines and impart the skills. So these are the three components we proposed that there should be a tele-ICU setup that should happen. Then there should be a constant training that should happen. And there should be a certification of people who undergo training in the nuances of intensive care. So these are the three components uh, that was uh, implemented during COVID, which which uh, possibly needed more systematization uh, after COVID. So for that, I think there was an e-governance that was created and 10-bed ICU project was created. Currently, as we speak, this 10-bed ICU project has been implemented in eight states uh, in Karnataka, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, and all these northeastern states are adopted. Currently, 2,000 ICU beds have been started in Taluka hospitals in these states. And the cost that is incurred is 70 crores has, is the grant that is raised for this tele-ICU project. And for 10 lakh, uh, for 10 bed ICU, the cost that was incurred in this project of e-governance was 58 lakhs. And the software that was incorporated to offer tele-ICU is the care software. So this is the project that was started in association with the Union Government of India by uh, by the NGOs, uh, which is which all comes under the umbrella of e-governance. And currently, if you see, uh, the, these are the number of Taluka hospitals which are connected to tele-ICU hubs. As you see in Karnataka, there are 41 which are enabled for this 10-bed uh, ICU in Taluka level and 36 in Andhra Pradesh, 40 in Telangana. And these are the numbers that are all connected to digital health at this point of time as I'm speaking. And this is the depiction of the care software that is incorporated to capture the clinical, monitored, and investigative modalities. And these are some of the pictures of tele-ICU monitoring that is happening in these hospitals. And these are the partners. These are the government partners that has partnered with these NGOs. And as you see, there is government of Assam, Karnataka, Telangana, Meghalaya, and all the northeastern states. And these are the project partners. So these all come under the umbrella of e-governance and all. So basically, there is a Infosys Foundation uh, by Nandan Nilekani and Shikan Nadamuni. Uh, all these are partnered and creating this huge uh, sort of a network of tele-ICU to transform lives. So thank you one and all. So this is the journey so far. So, uh, so my conclusions would be the future of healthcare in India will be significantly transformed by adoption of tele-ICU. 
and this is happening with a war footing from the government side and the take off in the private i've only spoken about what is happening in the public health so the take off in the private sector has still not happened so we would see uh, possibly i'm eagerly looking at uh, the private hospitals who would partner uh, with with people like me where we can really gain traction in tele icu and uh, and transform lives uh, because the government is really doing wonders by taking good sort of an icu care to remote hospitals in northeast and these states and the intent of this e governance i'm told is because i'm an advisor for uh, uh, for uh, doing the training and uh, imparting of the skills so it is to expand the horizons to all the states in india uh, and uh, i think the next 10 years you will see a lot of transformation that is happening in this digital space and private sector still needs to really look at this as a viable potential uh, to have a huge traction in this space so you can visit my website www.drpradeepranga.com to rehear to this lecture and as i'm speaking we have submitted the guidelines for tele icu uh, for india uh, to our society of uh, intensive care in india so i'm hoping to see these guidelines being published which can be used as a template for anyone wishing to start tele icu so thank you very much